Hello and welcome to Composers Roundtable episode 12. My name is Sam. I'm here with Simin Ambrugge. And also we are very honored and very excited to have the great composer John R. Graham. If you don't know about him, he has been involved with examples for uh, King's Glaive, Final Fantasy XV, Kirin Gakuro, but also worked on projects like Avatar, Edge of Darkness, Night at the Museum 2, Benjamin Button and The Mummy, just to mention a few. So we are very excited to have him here so we can talk lots about composition. So very much welcome, John. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me on, Sam. All right. So uh, let's dig into a little bit more. Who are you? How? Um, what can we tell our audience about you? Well, I uh, I grew up in uh, in the woods in Virginia, and uh, most of the music I heard growing up was just very small ensembles and bands. But uh, when I was fourteen, my we we finally got a proper stereo, and someone gave us a. Uh, a copy of Beethoven's Third Symphony, the famous Eroica Symphony. And I played it, I don't know, a hundred times, and I completely fell in love with music through Beethoven, as <laughs> composers have been doing for 200 years. So uh, I decided when, when I got out of university that I should uh, go into the film business because the it's the only place that's that's really readily you can get your hands on a full orchestra these days. Mm. There's a concert thing, but the, you can probably count on one or two hands the number of uh, composers who get really extensive performances in concert. Whereas with uh, uh, the movie business, you can get huge orchestras and choirs and the whole thing. And that has worked out really well. One of the avenues I pursued, you mentioned Avatar. Uh, uh, I worked on a bunch of movie trailers, a hundred movie tra trailers mm. or so. And the great thing about movie trailers is that, I mean, Avatar is an exception because it was a very popular movie, but there are lots of movies that are not so popular. Mm. And once they, they spend $150 million on some movie that they know is, eh, they are price insensitive about how much it costs to promote it. So they're willing to hire a full 80, 90 piece orchestra, a full 40, 50, 60 voice choir, and you get, you get all the stuff. So movie trailers wow. were a wonderful avenue for about 10 years. And uh, that sort of bled off into some other things after that. Hey, John, you mentioned, you mentioned university. So where, where, did you, um, where did you initially start studying uh, as far as well, being able to I, I get into that environment? Yeah, I went to Williams College, which was a, is a very traditional liberal arts school, and I studied basically poetry and music. And I'd say one of the things, if there's something unusual about the way I think when I write, I, I spend as much time reading books and poetry as I do listening to music. So for me, the story and the emotions and the inspiration behind the story are really at least equally important, if not more so. And uh, I went to graduate school at Stanford and I studied at UCLA and, you know, I, I did what a lot of people do when they get to L.A. And just I did 30 or 40 student movies and wow. then finally got on my first feature film, which is called Full Contact. Mm, yeah, and, I remember that. Uh, <laughs> I was uh, stunned, <laughs> stunned by that movie. Yeah. Because I had never seen a kickboxing movie before. So they said, oh, it's a kickboxing movie. Like, everyone knows what that is. So I didn't know what that is. So I rented a few movies, and I didn't like the scores. And uh, so I just wrote almost a full percussion score for that. Mm -hmm. So I thought, you know, if you're going to punch people in the head, that's percussion. <laughs> so from the, the – but I just finished a Netflix movie uh, called The Royal Treatment. Mm -hmm. That's a romantic comedy with the same director who directed that movie full contact many years ago so you know sometimes you bump into people on low budget projects and you end up later working with them on something that's you know a different genre and more fun it's very important to keep uh you know the contacts the network it really is you never know yeah. what it leads I, I guess full contact could be a romantic movie haha in a way yeah. the name at least <laughs> no. not you, the most romantic I, for, is, uh, I forgot that it was so i was quite young when i actually saw that my friends were like oh you gotta see this movie but uh wasn't that a lot of synths in there it's like 80s stuff or am i forgetting wrong yeah, there was a fair amount of synths i i 
I had a tiny little budget and I hired some cellos and a saxophone and a guitar player and mm. um, I, again, a wind player as well. So I had some live instruments in it, but it, in those days you really, you kind of had to rely on, on sample drums and synths for the sound. Mm -hmm. Mm. That's certainly no full orchestra, but you know, cellos, they can play uh, harmonics, so they can play really high. Yeah. And it adds a sort of flavor to the sound, even if you don't have a full orchestra chugging away. So it actually sounds pretty good. Yeah. Oh, I see a cello behind you. Do you play? An yeah, yeah. Do you play the cello? <laughs> I, I do play a little bit. I, I took lessons for a long time, but I, I have to admit, I when I want a cello, solo cello in any score, I hire somebody to finish it off, even though if I might rough it out myself. But it's always good to know an instrument. But would you, or you can you see yourself a pianist or is there a main instrument or? You're mostly a vocalist. Oh, really? So, oh, interesting. Which I, I find very freeing. A lot of people are guitar mm -hmm. players or piano players. And I play guitar and I play the piano. But I find the great thing about a voice is if you record yourself, you can record any kind of articulation. So yes. if you're playing guitar, it comes out as guitar music. But if you're singing, you can sing da dee dee, da, 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 da. you know, you can add these colors and emotions that you can't really do on a wind instrument or piano or something like that. I completely agree. That's so great to hear. I, I always said that uh, voice is fantastic to write with. You know, you can record yeah. yourself and you don't have to sound great, but you get the emotion, you get what you want to do. And then no, you I follow mean, that. I do yeah. sound great, but you don't have to. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you do. I didn't mean that. I'm just saying that even if you're not a singer, you could use this and it's so easy to keep the idea. You can even record it while you're walking. You know, I'm like I got this yeah. idea and yeah, I totally agree. But, you know, I really was interested in that thing. You said you're a poet or have done poetry and I really I didn't know this and I thought it was really cool. And I just wanted to know. And the reason I'm asking is because. I don't know. I, I've always gone for the music in my life. I've sort of, not, I, what do you say, ignored the lyrics, unfortunately. And it's not a good thing. It's just been my thing. I, I, for example, we can just take somebody I really love, Joni Mitchell. I actually liked her music. I haven't always heard the lyrics. It was much later when I started to grow up a little bit and say, oh yeah, the lyrics are kind of cool too. But it was really the music I was going for. And I, I just want to reflect on that, how it is different to create music if you're also a poet, if you're thinking about the words and so I don't know if you can tell us anything about that when you create music. Do you actually see words in your lines as well, or, or, or is it just music? Well, I, I do sometimes. I mean, what I the, the, the reference to poetry for me is a little bit maybe more on the emotional side. That mm. one of the things I, I, if, when I was just starting out, I had this idea, oh, I'll write a bunch of uh, kind of rubbish, poppy sounding stuff that that I can make money with. Mm. But the problem is, I the problem with me at least was, I was very condescending toward that format. And mm. so the music I thought was quite mediocre. And, and it's not gonna get traction. I mean, the thing about people, the, the artists who are very successful in the pop realm is, they're into what they're doing. They're not faking it. Yeah. So I really felt like that was a good exercise because now I'd never do that. Mm. I if, even if the if the movie is silly or the movie is overly dramatic or whatever it is, I try to find something about it that I personally find sincere and compelling about it. Mm. And I lean that way. So sometimes the music can be, I, I know, because I've gotten this from producers and whatnot, a little surprising to them, but it it it's latched onto something about the scene or the movie or the story that to me is important and valid. Mm -hmm. That's a great uh, tip. I really like that. If you could say you steel man the project a little bit, you know, really try to see what is honest and true about this, no matter what you think. I yeah, definitely, no matter how weak it is, because some yeah. stuff is, you know, not that strong. Yeah. I mean, I, and also I definitely know now when I, when I started music, I was total snob, you know, only this music, everything else is shit, you know, but I oh. kind of changed that way. You know, I really tried to see you know, almost anything. What if there's some value in it? And I think that well, that's, helps. That's very tolerant of you, Sam. But I have to say, <laughs> I would, I do think it's important to have strong opinions if you're going to be a creator. And so I don't fault you for that at all, actually. I, I think, you know, when I meet young composers and say, I hate so and so, some famous composer, I say, that's fine. Hate them <laughs> all you want. What do you like and what are you into? And, you know, if you're into, you mentioned teasing before we came on, you're into that thing, great. If you're into your kids, you know, yeah. there are a lot of movies with kids yeah. 
uh, or with family moments. And I, I'm also a father and a husband, and that absolutely inspires me mm. all the time, all the time. So this is this is going to this is going to go in a, in a really weird direction. But this is this this is what I'm thinking of. So when when you walk up to a strange dog and they they're aggressive and and because we've got a few next door, this is from personal experience. Um, they know they know who you are, uh, not because of what you're saying or it's, it's it's your body language. It's what you're it's what you're projecting. And they sense that. Uh, so if if I go over and approach them and I'm I'm scared and that type of thing, they know it, and so they're going to get at me. So it's it's similar to what you're saying, John, that you have to have the confidence in who you are uh, and and believe, you know, make the listener believe you. You know, there's there's some singers and that I I hear I I, I don't believe you. Uh, it's it's not a matter of just reading off the lyric sheet and singing. It, you have and you have no emotional connection to it uh i don't believe what you're singing mm. uh and it's and so as soon as as soon as i get to the point where i'm confident i can walk right up to the, that dog and and say you know what i'm confident i know that you, i know you probably are such and such but i'm not going to you're not going to bite me today and just today i just walked over and just you know we're we're, we're best buds now <laughs> because they know who i am they believe me now they 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 first they saw this this little oh my gosh here here he comes let's get him and now they 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 see someone who has a little authority and I think that you have to I think that's so important what you're saying John is that you you have to really be secure in who you are and you have to define who you are because what you do is a result of that and people are going to either believe you or not they're going to listen to your music and go it sounds good but I really don't believe I don't believe that he's really believes what he's playing in that. Well, yeah. so. I, I that's a really excellent point, Simeon, that you have to believe it. And I guess I would uh, take it a little further, which is that if you don't adopt that posture, you're just defeating yourself. So if you're a young composer thinking, how do I be successful? The way you be successful is you do what you personally are into. You respond mm -hmm. to the images or the scene the way you personally feel about it. If you think, well, I think we should have choir here. Then put choir, mm. no matter what they say. Exactly. I had a, mm. a, a classic example of, of that where I was asked to score a scene for a uh, a movie, and the the composer they'd already they'd already hired somebody, but I knew the music supervisor, and they were not happy with what they had. And they said, "Well, look, you know, the one thing we don't we've tried everything, temp everything, but the one thing we know we don't want for this scene is circus music." And I look at the scene and I think that scene needs circus music. So I said, okay, uh, I won't play circus music. But then I wrote some circus music, and they loved it. And that is just a classic example to me of, <laughs> you know, the execution matters, but also you just have to do what you think is right because the alternative is you do something that they tell you they want, and you don't really want to do it, and it will always come out the way you said, Simeon, which is no one believes it. Mm. They yeah. don't buy it. I'm going to close my door. There's a little noise outside. One sec. No worries. And when, uh, while John is coming back, I just want to riff on that too. I, I really uh, agree with what you guys have said. And the way uh, I wanted to go back to what I said, that I was a snob, which is, you know, you can be one if you want to. But for me, it was actually liberating in the sense, like before I had this like, concept, I should only make this kind of music or jazz or whatever, or in this style. But now I'm I'm more liberated to do whatever I want to, whatever comes to my mind. So it's more fun actually, and I find that my music is more humorous sometimes. You know, if it works with it, like you said, the circus music perhaps. But it's just uh, gives me more. Um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Anyway, I am more allowed to create whatever that comes to my mind, and usually, yeah, it's better music normally, and I'm having well, more fun. It's it's free. It's 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 a freedom. Yeah. Yeah. So so as, as you were saying, Sam, I. I a lot of people who want to be composers, you know, you you don't suddenly decide when you're 25 you want to be a composer. I mean, I wanted to be a composer when I was seven. Mm. So I would hum things and sing songs to myself while I was mowing grass or doing some household chore. And I, and then you go to university or you go wherever you go and you get lessons. And they mm. say, oh, you know, good counterpoint it looks like this. And mm. good composing looks like that. And here's Sonata Rondo form and whatever it is. And you realize, you, so that you get all these shoulds and oughts, 
you know, you should write music this way. You ought to write music this way. Music that's simple is for peasants. Music, you know, it, it needs to be complicated. It needs to be Reichardt Strauss. And I love Reichardt Strauss, but it doesn't all have to be Reichardt Strauss. Sometimes it can be Louis Louis. And Louis Louis has <laughs> helped a lot of people fall in love and have a good time. So uh, I, I think what you're saying, Sam, is really important for younger composers to just learn it. Mm. Don't ignore it, but then forget it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you, you need to use the tools as long as they're useful. And then when you don't need them, you get rid of them. Absolutely. I mean, there's so many forums like what plugins to use or what instruments to use and how you write all this stuff. And, and people are just attacking each other for doing the wrong thing. And I'm like, hey, who cares? You know, put in 68 violins if you want to. Who cares? Do a massive chord. If it sounds good, just enjoy it. You know, it's, it's, we don't need to, uh, you know, go down with those rules so much. And, but it's, it's great. It's important to study so you know the basics and then do whatever right. you But want. even Berlioz is far, I think, yeah. <laughs> uh, I remember when he wrote Symphony Fantastique, but he, he wrote pieces for four orchestras. Mm. I mean, and then we're talking, what, almost 200 years ago, not quite, but, but pretty close to it. And mm. so the idea of masses of resources, that's, that's not so new. It mm. sometimes seems a little new. Well, but it's, yeah. it's been around for a while. Yeah, it's fun to, definitely fun to study music history. I know I, my, well, when I've done it, my students always hate music history, but I love it because you find out all these great <laughs> things that people did. And have you seen that? Yeah, that was 150 years ago and you think it's new, you know? I just, uh, yeah, I like that stuff. So listen, um, there's so many interesting questions, but I really was like latching on this. I see that on your website, uh, it's a lot of Japanese. I think it is, right? So yeah. it's like, you speak Japanese. I, I don't, tragically. No. I would love to learn Japanese, but one thing about one thing about when you're a child, you can get away with kind of a childish way of learning a foreign language. And so I learned French as a child, and I speak oh. pretty good French for a child. But one oh, yeah. thing about <laughs> going to and trying to be a professional in, in a foreign language, that's a very risky thing to do. So fortunately, my wonderful agent, Koyo Sone is originally from Japan. He lives in LA. He's an LA agent with an LA agency, but he's originally from Southern Japan and he is a brilliant, thoughtful, and contrary to popular belief, extremely honest person. Mm. And he translates everything uh, and is just tireless about it. So, wow. But, but that show was a wonderful show because. As we were talking about sincerity, that show was written by a guy. I don't know how old he is, but he's he's up there. And mm -hmm. yet he gets the first billing in the show. The show is about a seminal part of Japanese history that resulted in uh, the unification of Japan, which was by no means certain before that period. And wow. so it was the show was written by the by the writer and the producers with utter devotion mm. and it was so satisfying for that reason but one of the things they kind of liked is i when i write so i write a minute of music say one minute mm. i can write pa three pages or four pages of what i'm thinking of every little bar mm. uh, and what i'm trying to convey with this harmony and the brass comes in and what's happening there and so Take, to take one example, there was there's about a 17 minute piece in there, and I won't walk through 17 minutes, but <laughs> you know, it's everything from I'm thinking of Achilles in his tent, uh, who won't fight at the beginning of the Iliad. I don't know if you guys have read the Iliad, uh, because that's kind of part of what's going on in the story. And then he gets angrier and angrier and angrier, and he finally changes his mind and decides to fight. And that evolution uh, is is detailed out over many minutes. And so I wrote all this stuff down in English, sent it to my agent, and he translated it into Japanese because the, the show is very popular and a lot of people like to know what, what's going on with it. Wow. So so that sounds really amazing. So how did you get into it? You talked a little bit about it, but how does one, how did you get into Japan of all places? It's quite a different culture from American, you know, or music-wise and story-wise and everything. Well, I would, I certainly agree with you. And there are so many examples of that. Uh, but I, I originally got introduced to video games in Japan with Square Enix. Mm, so okay. yeah. Square Enix is a major uh, developer of video games. And one of their very popular video games that's been around for about 30 years is Final Fantasy. Mm. And so they decided to 
create a new version of Final Fantasy, new new uh, episode fifteen, mm-hmm. and they asked me to do the arranging for the trailer. Someone else, the original composer, had written the trailer, and she was writing for the game, and. So I did the, all the orchestration and, and I conducted and recorded here in L.A. Uh, because they they wanted the, the, a sort of a Hollywood sound. So that's what we gave them. And and my agent said, you know, I think they're going to ask you to write for the movie. I said, well, there's a long way from arranging to write for a movie. Mm. So they gave me a few little tests. They had me write a little bit of music for another game and a little bit of arranging for another just to make sure that it wasn't just a one hit wonder. And then they hired me to do the movie. And I. Wow. Um, kept thinking, wow, they're going to fire me any day. And then, <laughs> wow. Yeah. It turned it was, out they didn't, so. That must be hard. quite overwhelming. I don't know what you've done before that previously, but did you study all the previous music, the games, or were they looking for a traditional score, something that was more Japanese, or did you have completely free hands? Or Well, that's a good mm. question. I, mm. They really mm. did give me a totally free hand, mm. except that the uh, game composer wrote the main title mm. and she's a very very popular and famous composer in japan and a lovely lovely person and so her name is is yoko so they said it was john and yoko so that was a little <laughs> pity but, but, but uh, they did not want a traditional japanese score imagine because that they, had, they would have hired a japanese composer because there mm. are lots of great japanese composers and they, they wanted something more i don't know rock and roll or Hollywood. <laughs> I don't know what, what you call it, but they wanted a, an enormous sound. So we mm. hired that, that. We had a huge orchestra recorded in Nashville for about a week, recorded in a little bit in Japan, a little bit in LA. Uh, and I guess that was it, just Nashville, LA. And, and But we had a full resources for that. That was a fantastic project. Exciting. Wow. So did you go over there the, to Japan and do, or? To not Japan? not no. that one. Uh, mm. But I did go over for the TV show for Kieran. So mm. Kieran came about because NHK, NHK is the national broadcaster of Japan. It's mm. like the BBC of Japan. And they have had this show on, it's called the Taiga Drama mm. since 1963. And it's a very interesting phenomenon because I don't know of anything similar to it in any other country. I mean, there may be, but I never heard of it. Mm. They, what they do is each year they have a whole new team and in a completely different set of characters, focusing on one person from Japanese history who's very seminal and important to Japanese history. Mm. And this time it was Mitsuhide, who is the villain of Japanese history. If you read any history of Japan, they will mention Mitsuhide's betrayal of Nobunaga, Mm. who was sort of in many people's minds in Japan, the George Washington of Japan. Mm -hmm. Now, like any form, any kind of history, it's imperfect. It's set. It's in the 1500s. There's a lot of stories. No one knows if some of them are true. And so there's a lot of speculation. And as a composer, you have to take into account not just what you've read in history books, but what you know is in the popular imagination. Mm. So mm. Nobunaga, there are video games about Nobunaga. Mm. There's a whole bunch of them, actually. It's mm. like a whole subgenre. So he's a popular, well-known character. So you have to take that in on board too. But anyway, long story short, it was the same thing we talked about before, Sam and Simeon, both of you guys. You have to respond how you respond. Mm -hmm. So I had listened to all the themes they'd done for decades in the show, and they're fine, but I went a totally different direction. And um, and then my agent, Koyo, so Mm -hmm. he goes, he flies to Tokyo, Mm -hmm. He sends a limo around to the NHK people to get them out away from their phones and, you know, offices and everything to a recording studio. And he didn't even tell them he had a demo, hmm. but it's a, rec- a cool place, has gigantic speakers. And he listened to them and they told him what they wanted. And he said, well, actually, I have something here. And he played it for him. And I had written a, a letter about what, a, what I was thinking when I wrote it and why I wanted to work on the project. And it, and it worked out. But... Again, they were very careful. They flew six people over, I guess it was, to meet with me before I was really hired. Yeah, okay. Because, you know, a demo is great, but... And they liked it. The the demo became the main title, so they really liked the demo. But it... Wow. 
really encouraging. I just want to say again, I mean, even we hammered on a little bit that it's so great that because it can be so frustrating if you're trying to sound like something else, you're going to hate the project because you're not satisfied. You're not doing what you want. And they hired you because they probably heard your music and like what you're doing. So you should continue to do what you do. So it's it's really, it's so nice to hear that you should go with your instincts of what you want, because that's probably what they hired you for. So it's really, I really so. encouraging. I just want to say I have very little experience with the Asian market, which is huge. Uh, so I don't know much about it, but I'm sure it can be a sort of lot of lost in translation going on there. I was once hired by a company called Media Cube that in South Korea, it's quite big. They're creating music there. And they obviously wrote to me with Google Translate. That was so obvious. And their way of talking is like they really liked what I was doing, but I was like really scared because I didn't know. I couldn't tell if they, what they wanted. It was like one of the most frustrating thing I ever done. But I was really happy with the results and they were very nice. But I just <laughs> wanted to say, I was like, wow, it's not just translation. It's like the whole different culture and how you behave. And I don't know if you have experienced anything like that from, in, in, from the Japanese well, guys. <laughs> there are different cultural things. Mm -hmm. And of course, um, I, I think there's a general idea notion that Americans have this homogenous way of behaving and there's mm. a general notion that Japanese people have a homogenous way of behaving but of course that isn't really true either no, no. <laughs> I, I went to boarding school in England and I grew up in, in Virginia as I said and, and people are very very indirect in both places mm -hmm. so whether you're talking about England or or Virginia at least not the rest of the US necessarily but a big disagreement where I grew up is to say, well, I don't know if I see it quite the same way. That mm -hmm. is a throwdown. That's yeah, like, yeah. I flatly disagree <laughs> with you. And of course, <laughs> that's actually how a lot of people are in England. Not everybody. I mean, mm -hmm. there are plenty of blunt people there, too. Mm -hmm. But I think one of the uh, common assumptions is that Americans are very blunt and direct and the Japanese people are very indirect. But I mm -hmm. found it, I didn't find that to be the case at all. I felt okay. that. People were very direct with me. Mm. And fortunately, I had my agent to translate. So mm. I didn't have the Google Translate problem. <laughs> but yeah, I, I think helps. if you really listen to what people are saying, they're, they're telling you what they want and what they don't. Mm. 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 Just because they're courteous about it doesn't mean they're not. You know, and they like most of what I did. But of course, you know, there's some stuff they didn't like. So, uh, Yeah. So we're, we're talking a little bit about uh, about new sample libraries that we're dealing with uh, perhaps more Asian Japanese music. So uh, I wanted to give it over to Simin perhaps, but um, asking a little bit what you were using and or how you got the sounds and all that maybe. Sure. Mm. Well, mm. paradoxically, for both at least the two projects we've been talking about, not so much the um, the video game stuff, but because mm. I have done some video game stuff that was traditional Japanese music. But for these shows, I hardly used any traditional Japanese mm -hmm. instruments. There are some great sample libraries out there. Sonica Instruments is absolutely incredible. The only problem is you actually have to read the manual, but they Sonica makes really good Japanese traditional instruments. But the other issue with with any kind of traditional instruments is that they are always somewhat limited. They're limited in range mm -hmm. and in volume and harmony, the, I guess. Yeah, really mm -hmm. in many ways. Mm -hmm. If you pick, uh, you know, bluegrass music or you pick traditional music of Germany or something. And yet there's some similarities, like they're bagpipe type instruments in mm -hmm. many cultures. Mm -hmm. There are double reeds. There, there were certainly wooden flutes absolutely everywhere. So it, I didn't avoid it, but since no one really knows what music sounded like anyway in the 1500s in Japan, I really mm -hmm. went with the emotion first and used the resources that I thought would create that emotion, which often included a gigantic orchestral sound mm -hmm. and a huge track too, mm -hmm. because it was, it was momentous. These events absolutely created the Japan that we have today. Mm. And I think this, this, it's a really interesting thing that because we, we, we come into things with our own biases and our own uh, prejudices, and we look through the world at, at, with, at our own, with our own lens. And I think what's really cool is what we're saying is there, there's not necessarily a, a Japanese type of music or an uh, American type of music or a German type of music. There is music, and the music interprets the the emotions and the situations of that we we all are experiencing life on this planet. And and so music is a way to express the emotions. I keep hearing that word in our conversation, and that is 
the emotion. And that is something that everyone on this planet can can relate to. Uh, because listen, I've, I, earlier this morning I was playing. I mean, there's nothing that can can bring me into an ultimate puddle than some beautiful consordino strings. I mean, it's just like, oh my gosh, it's just like it just washes over you. And and uh, so, yeah, just like that, you know. <laughs> and uh, it's it's incredible. It's incredible how. It's not necessarily the instruments, but it's the sounds that we're hearing. The yeah. and it and it stirs something up in inside of us. So, uh, you know, it yeah. So this this whole thing about you know, there's there's this type of sound and that type of sound, and you've got to do this a certain way. Well, I think we're we're kind of just pretty much not completely throwing it out the window, but but most of it because it's about how does how does it make me feel? How does it how does it suit the picture? How does it match what I'm seeing? Mm-hmm. It's a very, very interesting. Yeah, but, yeah. I, I absolutely agree, Simeon. And, and I, I didn't avoid Japanese instruments. And there are uh, some pieces. There's a there's a seven, or I guess it's a six CD box set that that Sony released at the end of the show. Mm. And there's there are a few pieces on there that really do sound much more flavored like traditional Japan. They they relate more to the emperor. The emperor is a character in the show and has quite a number of very important scenes. And that music is utterly different from anything else that's in the score, mm. as I mean, you can imagine. Uh, the emperor is supposed to have uh, d- descended from the sun goddess. Mm-hmm. And so I thought about, like, so what? what's the sun? The sun glows. The sun burns. The sun is dangerous, but the sun is warming and comforting. The sun has all these attributes to it. And so I used a lot of symbols, you know, metal symbols, and I used a lot of brass and choir uh, because I felt like brass and symbols, they make it, they can make it glow mm-hmm. in a way wow. that I associate with the sun. So you, you kind of make a few arbitrary decisions like that. But again, Simeon, it's back to your point that you, you have to s- say to yourself, how do I respond to this? How do I think about this? If I met the emperor, let's, as you said, you know, whether you're Japanese or American or German, it doesn't mm-hmm. matter. If you met someone at that time, how would that feel? And that's mm. what I want. But I was wondering um, about this, but emotions. Uh, and obviously, we're I'm talking mostly about my limited experience here. But I work with a few different companies uh, in in the world, and some on the Asian side, and some of the European side. And I do find, even though these are generalizations. I do find that the, the Koreans, for example, South Koreans, they were very much into super emotive, emotive music. Just make it more emotive. They really wanted like to blood to come out of it, you know, and, and, and the tears. Uh, while I presented some of those demo tracks for a French company, they were like, they were like no, <laughs> that is way too much. We don't like this stuff at all. And I just felt like, well, maybe there is some cliches here, but it does seem like certain cultures are more into that stuff because I definitely felt like they wanted that. But I don't know. Is that your experience that it's easier or... No, no. I, I I do think that there are vogues, mm. and that those you have to kind of pay a bit of attention to those vogues. Right mm. now, uh, it seems that you, know, you go to the movies in if it's a, if it's a Los Angeles based production, there aren't too many melodies. True, uh, <laughs> and mm. I don't really quite know why that that it what the result of that. Unfortunately, I love I love cellular writing. There's a there's a wonderful score. James Newton Howard did for Signs. Mm. And whatever you think of the movie Signs, that score is amazing. It's mm. like this three note cell. Mm. He uses it all through the movie, turns it upside down, changes the meter, changes the register, changes the instrumentation, adds solo instruments on top. Mm. So, so you can be brilliant without writing a melody. Mm. Not that he can't write melodies, he writes beautiful melodies too, but. I, I really have enjoyed working with East Asia. So I've, I've done some projects with South Korea, for China, for uh, quite a few now for Japan. Um, mm. And they, uh, today anyway, people seem to favor melody. And I, uh, you know, who wouldn't like to write melodies? Yeah, it's interesting. I, I definitely preferred myself. And this is just a personal preference. But I was just thinking for the, the latest Marvel movies that are being very big, very huge and all that. I personally have not been impressed at all by that music. It it fits. It's well done. I mean, I'm, I'm you know, I will be happy to have done something like that. But I felt really the lack of themes 
there is one, but there it's just in general. I felt like I'm not impressed. It's not going anywhere. It's just background music to me. And I want I was wondering maybe if I'm correct in this analysis, maybe it is they they, they don't want it to interfere too much. They just want the action to be on the on visually, and the music is just for enforcing that. And if it comes in too much, I don't know. What do you guys think? Am I off there? Well, I, I mean. I think it also depends a bit on the audience and mm. what the audience's tolerance is for for breathers. So mm. one of the things that I would say is common in action movies produced in America is they are absolutely nonstop packed. There is <laughs> not a, a two second breather. Anywhere. Mm -hmm. It's always trying to be at 11, turning it to 11 all the time. By contrast, in this show I worked on, there is one example I'm thinking of right at the moment where a, a character is trying to make a decision. This woman who loves him asks him a question. There mm -hmm. is a 30 second. It is not shorter than 30 seconds. Pause while mm -hmm. he thinks. There's no music. There, there's background sound, they're outside, but there's, it's 30 seconds. You wouldn't mm. find a 30 second gap in a Marvel movie to save your life. And I, mm. I think that um, you know, it's just a totally different mindset, those movies. Those movies are roller coaster rides. It's like, come on, everybody, let's have a 12 French horn section. Let's have eight trombones. Let's let it blare the whole time. And that's kind of, the experience, I, I guess, I, that the audience is looking for for those movies. Yeah. So, well, in, in that example that you mentioned, how powerful was that 30 seconds? I mean, I can I could just imagine it just you're, you're gripping, you're, you're gripping and, and you're, you're just like, OK, come on, come on, answer them. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Because you're the theater. I, I think the, the thing one of the cool things is the things that you don't hear and you don't see the theater of your mind. It, it starts to fill fill those things in. Uh, and I, I think that and because when you when you're going da 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 da, you know, ah, boom, boom, you know, you, you just like you don't have a breather uh, and it's so frenetic. And then you don't know what the story was about. What did I just see? Uh, but it's just like that, that 30 seconds of silence. Um, uh, it, 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 it seems like it just kind of is, sucks you in. It, it pulls you right into the mind of, of those characters. I, I, I couldn't imagine because I'm thinking I, when I'm watching a movie, I'm always thinking about, OK, what's what's happened? What's going to happen next? Or what is this person feeling in this moment? So, yeah. So, I, yeah, the roller coaster ride is real. But I think we we need to we need those breathers to establish context and. And uh, I think that's what music helps to do so much. It helps to anchor the context sometimes. Could, could, it, be that, of it. could it be that dynamics is really like, you know, it's been this, uh, um, what do you call it? Max, uh, forgot the word because my brain, you know, the, the the music has been pushed all the time until it was said in Europe at least, like no more, you know, cannot maximize the music beyond a certain uh, level. Everybody's just pushing uh, the music, the popular music at least, to the limit. So there's no dynamic whatsoever. Is it sort of the same thing in the movies, perhaps at least the action movies? Because I also find that music with dynamics is way more refreshing and interesting. Uh, the Ghibli Studios, if you're familiar, you know, with the Japanese, uh, I love them because they have that dynamic. I mean, there are many more studios and movies from Japan, right, but obviously. But in general, yeah, they have the possibility to have the dynamics. Yeah. yeah. That's a, that's a good example, Ghibli Studios, and mm. I think those movies are beloved all over the world. Mm. But as, as, as we're sort of all agreeing, I think that's a completely different mentality and, and uh, intention mm. than uh, Marvel Comics or a roller coaster ride, mm. which I put more yeah. in the same, same uh, context. I mean, those movies are enormously, enormously popular, mm. and so I really don't fault them for what they are. I, I you know... And I'm sure it's incredibly gratifying to write write that kind of music yeah, for yeah. that with those sorts of resources. But nevertheless, um, I, I I love to be able to think a little bit about what I'm working on. And one of the mm -hmm. things I I enjoy about uh, video game music is mm -hmm. is that that mm -hmm. the pace is so much slower than say TV is or even a movie that you can really think. And the people you're working with are not so. Honestly, they're just not so afraid because when you're working on a movie, 
often the director's been working on it for five or eight or more years. Mm. Wow. And if it bums, man, that's a lot of time down the drain. Mm. But with a video game company, you have many people working on it. And mm. honestly, if one video game is not as successful as you'd hoped, you still got a job. Mm. So and, that's actually a really and, good and point. Plus, if they don't yeah. like something, they say, well, we don't really like that. We like this part of it, but we can you do more with that? Or can you make mm. it more exciting or more emotional or whatever it might be? It's a really good point. I just really, I haven't thought about that because I actually haven't worked so much with video music, uh, video game music. I would love to, if anyone's out there. No, anyway. But, uh, but, but that you have the time because, yeah, the game is longer. It's play. There's more moments. You can, you can, it seems like you're, it's, you're more free, right? You, have, you can play more with dynamics and you have all these you different moments, right? free. And also, mm. I don't... <laughs> I just don't get as many directions from video game people. I mean, they have some temp ideas, but mm. they're not necessarily as married to them as, as sometimes can be the case with a movie. Mm. Mm. Yeah, no, that's because I, yeah, I just feel like sometimes there are these massive, I don't know if you play games, I love to, I don't have time, but there are these massive role-playing games that, you know, it take 200 hours to complete. And I, I just uh, imagine the people creating music for that, you know, how... I don't know. I, I don't know why I'm throwing that out, but it seems like a lot of work to to fill all that content. I don't know. <laughs> well, it, it, it is a ton of work to fill all that content, mm. but I guess uh, the, the other thing about video games is video games are being rolled out in various ways now. It used to be that you did the whole game, you put it on a, on a uh, Blu-ray or whatever you put it on, whatever mm. format, and you shipped them out. But now, mm. of course, most things are not done that way. And mm. And you see video games being rolled out in segments. So you'll get the first, you know, yeah. five segments, and then they add another one a few months later, and another one, another. Mm. So there's the the production process has changed a bit as well, mm. and that that's really fun. It, it means you can change directions a little bit. You can have a section of the game that sounds a little different. I, I just I think video games are very promising for young composers. I would mm. absolutely go that way uh, because it's it. And, and plus, they, they want to differentiate themselves. They are willing to hire a big orchestra. They are willing to take chances. Mm. Um, I forget. Uh, I mean, there's a video game that's been very popular that my son loves, which I kind of enjoy too, and, and there are no strings. I mm -hmm. think there's one solo violin, that's it. So, so you can do some unusual stuff. Mm. Even though it's orchestral sounding, it's it's not a synth sound. Do, do you find that it's okay today to not, I mean, obviously we all want real orchestras, but the samples are pretty good. Do you find that it's okay to use only sample contact nowadays? Well, I think you have to do what you have to do, but my, I don't really like that. <laughs> okay. No, so right. no matter how small the budget is, if you can mm. just get one live player, Mm. Or one singer, one cellist, one clarinet, anything, mm. something living, breathing that connects the notes and sells what you're trying to what you're trying to do. Uh, you you really, you, I think, as a young composer, a lot of people don't do that. I think it's a huge blunder. I, I you and for for a lot of reasons. First of all, you need to learn how to do it, mm. and your music will sound so much better three years from now mm. yes. than it does today. So if you if you did something in 1998 and it was all samples, you can really hear that. But if mm. you did something in 1998 that had some singers or it had even a, you know, a, a string quintet covering the sound, it sounds, it sounds okay still. Mm. Wow. So I really am a huge believer in, in selling the emotion and sincerity with real players, even if you can only afford a handful. Mm. And if that's, you have, you know, a hundred, even that's even better. <laughs> that's a great tip, really, and it's also more fun to work with other people because I know for myself, I'm guilty of doing all myself, sitting here in my studio, and you know, it gets a little lonely. So at least I have other people to actually, you know, know hire a celloist or or a singer, or whatever. It's uh, it could be more fun, more inspiring. You it's, get more ideas. It's so much more fun. It's a yeah. lot more work. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's know, a synergy that happens. Uh, you know, there's there's something about working with other musicians, and and it the two become greater than the than the sum of their parts, and mm. the 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 synergy that happens. You know, when when you're when you're hearing a live player, and then when that live player is overlaid on maybe a synth part, it brings such a, a, a well, it breathes life into the Tin Man. It puts a heart in into that into that uh, 
into that inanimate pretty much what's going on it breathe it, it breathes that life into into that so mm -hmm. it's just uh, an incredible thing and then as uh you know and then anytime that you can be around real musicians i i mean just i'm always a proponent of if you can go see a live orchestra go see it mm -hmm. uh, if you can go hear a live even if it's something that you're not necessarily a big fan of go see it expose yourself to as many uh, real experiences as you can, because that deposits something in you that that will come out um, at some point. It's gonna it's gonna come out. Uh, you know, yeah, I I totally agree. Uh, you know, it's uh, John. You just having that live element mm -hmm. is is incredible. It is. I mean, I sing in a choir. I've got yeah, actually some handle right here. I sing in a choir every week and. It's kind of a relief to sing someone else's music from time to time <laughs> so that you don't have to think about, well, but should I change that? You know, because you're not going to change handle. So, uh, or Bucks to Hooter or whoever it is. Yeah, yeah. But I love that. Uh, yeah. Just experiencing from the inside someone else's compositions mm. uh, every week is it, just a wonderful, even if you're in an amateur group and you're not even that good, it doesn't have to be that great. Mm. I think one of the problems with, modern culture is that people feel they have to have a lot of equipment or training or a coach or something to do the simplest things riding mm -hmm. a bike you see people at least in la with what looks like ten thousand dollars worth of stuff you know these mm -hmm. really expensive bikes and all these clips and i don't even know what but you know you go to amsterdam you just see little old ladies riding around on a bike yeah, you know, and that's actually one of my problems. I'm well well aware of it, but it still happens that I'm kind of in a in a way lucky that I'm not super rich because I think I would buy too too many things, too much gear, and that would actually be what would would hold me back because I would then, you know, figure all this stuff and buy more things and it's great to have things, you know, but but it probably would stop me from writing more music in in my case. It, mm. it reminds me of a classic Dick Van Dyke episode mm -hmm. uh where he he's trying to write his novel and he goes to the cabin uh, up in the mountains and he's got to have the right kind of pencils, the right kind of paper. And uh, and and so he's he's just, you know, it's all about the tools and the, you know, and and he winds up not writing anything uh, mm. except for the dedication. So that's I think that's the trap we all fall into. Man, mm. it, it, man, this new library just came out. I know if I got that, I would be I would I'm going to I'm going to be able to write better music with that. Mm. No, it's just another pencil. Uh, if you don't know how to write to begin with, it doesn't matter what kind of pencil you you have. You can you can pull one out of the drawer and write something just as beautiful as you can with a Mont Blanc that costs two thousand dollars. It's all in the I don't know. It's it's not necessarily about the tools. It's how you you use those tools. Um, I mean, uh, you know, <laughs> the great sculptors can pick up the same chisel and hammer as I do, but I'm sure not going to make, uh, make a beautiful statue. I'm going to make a mess. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, it's like, it goes back to our very beginning of our conversation about just learning and, and, uh, just learning, learning the basics and, and then just going from there. Uh, so, yeah, it, it's incredible. I agree with that. And, and I, I guess one of the delightful things that you can get now is, uh, some actual real Hollywood scores. In fact, some of the very best scores, I think written in recent years, there's uh, uh, Omni Publishing produces any number of scores, but one of them is How to Train Your Dragon. Mm -hmm. if, if you if you're a young composer and you want to learn how to orchestrate for picture, you buy that score and you're finished. And mm. the thing is, you don't have to study every bar of it or write it all out. Um, I mean, I heard that Wagner wrote out by hand with a quill, of course, all of Beethoven's symphony. I don't know if that's wow. true or not. Yeah, I but, heard that too. <laughs> but, but that whether that's true or not, it, it really helps to get your under your fingertips at least a few bars here and there, even if it's just four bars or eight bars. Mm. See how they do what they do. How do they voice the chords? What are the trumpets and the trombones doing? What are the French horns doing that's different from them? And how, how does the guy think about it or the orchestrator? So there's so much emphasis I find on uh, chat boards about composing on mm. the libraries, and I do don't I don't think that's totally misplaced at all. I have at least ten string libraries, and I use all <laughs> ten of them for different things. And I don't know how many choir libraries. Same thing, because they all sound a little different, even the mm. shorts. You know, so 
if you have an orchestra, you say, dig in a little bit more violas. Mm. But you can't do that with a sample. You can talk to samples all day. They don't respond. Mm. <laughs> so you have, to, yep. you have to have that other library that where they do dig in more and substitute it. So, but, but that said, I, I agree with, with what you guys are saying, that it's really important to at least know how the other guys who do know what they're doing, how they do it. Mm. Yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting. Uh, a while ago, I thought about we should ask you if you have any good tips for beginning composers. But I feel like that's what we had been talking about, you know, the last 15 minutes. But anyway, do you have any more good tips on perhaps how to start or, or perhaps if you want to get into game composing or movie composing, anything that anyone who wants to try I do, this? I do have one of? thing. And this is yep. a huge mistake I think I made for 10 years. Okay. Maybe two things. One thing is be yourself. Mm. Write what you think is cool. If you think it's cool, even if nine people out of 10 don't think it's cool, there's going to be somebody who says, hey, I hear what you're doing there. That is a little bit unusual, and that's a little different. Mm -hmm. So I made the mistake, and I think a lot of people make this mistake. I loved the scores I heard. I loved Jerry Goldsmith and John Williams and Hans Zimmer and James Newton Howard, absolute musical genius. But mm -hmm. if you ape those guys, mm -hmm. first of all, they're pretty good. <laughs> yeah. It's not very easy to, no. to do that, to imitate mm. them in a way that's successful. It usually just sounds like a pale imitation. Mm. Yes. So don't do that. Do mm. something wacky or weird or just what you're into. If you like mm. Elgar and that's the kind of music you want to write, then write your brains out and keep mm. working on it. If you want to write avant-garde stuff where you're tapping on your desk and that's what you're sampling, do that but be yourself. So that's one piece of advice. The other piece of advice, if there is one, is don't bother chasing after agents because agents are fantastic when you're negotiating or you're having a hard time getting paid by some company. Mm -hmm. They get you paid. They can maybe get you a better deal. They can make sure that you don't enter into something that's mistaken. But trying to get an agent in order to get your first gig, waste of time. Just mm -hmm. get your first gig then call the agents. Yeah, that's good advice, actually. call you even better. Mm, nice. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, excellent. That's that's really, 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 really helpful here. Um, I was thinking, um, what is your future thing? What are you working on next? What's happening for you? Well, I have uh, one thing I'm excited about, which is another video game in Japan project mm -hmm. that I'm pitching for. And mm -hmm. I been working on a video game for a Chinese company, and I don't really know how public it is, mm. but Xi Jinping, the head of the Communist Party in Japan, has recently, as you, as our audience might know, yeah. uh, come out with a wanting to limit the amount of time Chinese people play video games. I've heard that, yeah. <laughs> so that project, I've been working on it all year. It's actually on a little bit of a hiatus now where they mm. wait for the dust to settle and see what happens with that. So, uh, mm. But I've got basically two video game projects, and I, uh, I had a really good time working on this Netflix show with my old buddy uh, Rick Jacobson. So we'll see what he's doing next, too. He, we've worked together a lot over the years. All right. Yeah, something That's to so look good. forward then. Yeah. 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 So uh, I will link everything in the video here, but I just wanted to hear, where can we find out about you if you want to know more about you or where you have your music or what projects you're in? Sure. Well, the, it's all on Spotify and Amazon mm -hmm. Music and iTunes, and it's it's John R. Graham. And, mm -hmm. uh, and so you can find it that way. You've got my website up there on the cast and that there's quite a bit of information there in English and Japanese. And um, mm -hmm. so... Uh, but it, it, it's it's I just love the orchestra, and so mm. it's not really I'm not really much of a songwriter. I've written a few songs, but mostly it's orchestral based stuff, and and I I just love it. I've, mm. I've kind of gravitated a little away from the hybrid sound lately. I feel like that, and maybe it's been done to pieces. <laughs> well, maybe it's been done to pieces, and also uh, one score I've really enjoyed of uh, Hans Zimmer's recently is the Dunkirk score, which really mm. isn't a hybrid score so much. It's really a synth score in my, to my ears. I mean, I, I'm sure, yeah, and I always got real instruments too, but mm. I love that audacity mm. to take a subject that could not be more of a mythologized subject, the retreat from Dunkirk, 
of the mm. English. I mean, every English or UK citizen knows about that episode in, in history in World War II. And instead of using traditional brass and cor choral uh, instruments, which is what you kind of expect, no, he goes a completely different direction. And I thought that was really wonderfully provocative and audacious mm. and refreshing. But do you think that you kind of need that license? Uh, I was thinking also as, for example, Johnny Depp, the actor. I know that when he did uh, Pirates of the Caribbean, he just did what he wanted. And I know that the film crew weren't really like so happy with that choice because they had their sort of style, what the pirate should be. But he was Johnny Depp and he did what he wanted and he ended up working great. But if you're not that big, if you're not uh, a simmer, um, and, you know, Hans Zimmer, I mean, can you still... Yeah, I mean, I, we've said all the episode that, yes, do that anyway. But what do you think? It's, is it I, more difficult? I think, <laughs> I think you have to do that. I think yeah, if okay. you don't do that, honestly, you're writing yourself into a corner where you're just going to get mediocre derivative movies and, and stuff that sounds like, and sort of looks like some other movie that the director had in mind. I mean, if you want to work with people who are doing something audacious, another example uh, of something really out there, um, is uh, There Will Be Blood. I haven't it's seen that. It's an oh. absolutely nuts movie just to start with. But it's mm -hmm. also got a very, very unusual avant-garde string-based score. And it, I don't know how you could have the movie without the score. And that's the kind of marriage that I think all, all of us should strive for. Mm. So you're right. You might get fired. But yeah. What, so what? Yep. <laughs> You know, life, life yeah. lasts a long time. Mm, and, yeah. and, well, I, I just I'm thinking about Danny Elfman too. I mean, it, it, you know, just just another another example of somebody <laughs> that comes totally out of left field, out of another dimension, but has made such a huge impact because mm. he wasn't afraid to be himself. Mm. Um, uh, many years ago, it was like um, just just going through that imposter syndrome type of thing. Uh, mm. where where you you find yourself playing what you've heard and whatever, and you're trying to emulate others. And it's just like, I make a terrible somebody else. And it's just like mm. being comfortable with with that and uh, walk into those sessions like you you have the uh, the the um, oh, man, what is it? The the um, collateral or the the gravitas of a Hans Zimmer. You have to walk walk up to those walk up to those angry dogs like you're Hans Zimmer, yeah. and they're yeah, going to yeah. say, "Oh, it's Hans." And and so you know, yeah. they, they you project. You know, people are going to feel what you project. Um, mm. If you are projecting cowardice or or you're not sure of yourself, man, they're going to feel. They're going to know that. Mm. Uh, and it's and so it's like, yeah, I, I think it's a it's this has been such a great. Um, a great session today because it it's just helping us to to understand it's okay to like yourself. It's okay to 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 like to like your likes, like what you're doing, like you, the music that you like. Because um, we are again, we are all totally different. The world would be such a boring place if everybody was doing John Williams music. Uh, you know, so uh, but like John, what you're talking about is like if you're doing what you love to do. Then that's going to stand out because everybody else is doing this, but mm. you you were faithful to your convictions and whatnot, and so that hand is going to be seen. The director is going to say, "Oh, look at that! I see you. I see you there. I hear you." So um, yeah, man, this has been wonderful. Well, I've enjoyed. They, yeah. it. They, they might not like it, but at least <laughs> exactly. they, they know there's a person behind it instead of just a generic ten note chord. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. But it's also, it, it, it sounds a little bit different, but it's also something I talk, I teach uh, composition at a, a school here in Sweden, and we talk a little bit about you know, how do you approach people and stuff like that. And I even think uh, Alex, another YouTube here is quite a big, who does trailer music, talks about this, that uh, a mistake we often do is that we try to be the jack of all trades a little bit. Oh, I can do everything. I can do reggae and banjo, whatever. But uh, no, show you, it's kind of the same line. Show what, like one specific thing. Hey, I'm really good at circus music, you know or just as an example or whatever, and, and pitch that if you love that, if that's what you want to do, if that's what you're interested in, and you don't have to show everything to everybody because you shall sell yourself short. Well, but, that's yeah. very true. And one yeah. of the dumbest things you can do, I, I think anybody can do, <clears throat> myself included, is, <clears throat> is branch out into genres that you really don't know what you're doing with, whether it's 
I, I, the number of painful comedy cues on people's websites, just if it isn't really funny, just don't put it up there. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and also, just as you're saying, Sam, you, you can't do necessarily reggae and Strauss and uh, cartoons. It just isn't like that. No one wants mm. to hire you to do all those things. They want to hire you to do a thing. So mm. put up your very best, most personal, most differentiated stuff and sell yourself based on that. Mm. Absolutely. Hey, listen, this has been really, really great chat. Uh, you And I feel like we had really a, a, a strong theme here, you know, believe in yourself a little bit Disney, but I, I really understand what you mean. And it's very encouraging to to hear that, to sort of feel like, yeah, I will go with what I hear in my mind because that's why I want to be a composer anyway. I don't want to be a composer just to mimic everybody else. I want to, you know, play what I want to play. So that's that's so nice, so encouraging to hear. So again, thank you very much for coming to this podcast. Well, it's nice, nice to be on. Thanks for having me on. All right. Anything you want to mention, Simeon, before we say goodbye? No, for I'm today? just, uh, I'm just so enjoyed this time that we had together, and it's such a great, uh, great honor to meet you, John, and to to hear what you're what you're working on. And it inspires, it inspires us. Um, I'm I'm very inspired and and encouraged, you know, by our, what we're talking about today. Uh, so. Man, can't wait! Can't wait to hear 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 your next thing, and and go back and listen to some some of the beautiful things that you've you've already done. Yeah, well, thanks, Sam, and thanks, Sam. Yeah, and again, we're gonna link everything so you can find out more about uh, John. If you haven't listened to his music, I really recommend you do. There's some really really encouraging, interesting stuff, encouraging, interesting stuff there. So I really recommend you to check that out. So that's it for today. We will see you back in two weeks if all goes well. Thank you very much for listening. And if you're listening on a podcast, please uh, thumb us up or rate us so you can hear more of our shows. Thank you very much. See you next time. Bye.